to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Both are Delhi landmarks, but not many know of their common history of India's participation in the First World War that raged from 28th of July 1914 to 11th of November 1918. These landmarks honor the more than 70,000 soldiers and non-combatant volunteers who died for the British Empire. By the war's end, nearly 1.5 million men and officers and those of the volunteer corps from nearly all faiths and ethnic groups of the Indian subcontinent had served overseas for the cause of king and empire. On 26 January, India's Republic Day, the Prime Minister and the chiefs of the armed forces traditionally pay homage to India's fallen soldiers at the Amar Jawan Jyoti, the flame of the immortal soldier under the Grand Archway of India Gate. Not far, a new war memorial specifically honors soldiers who died for independent India. While the flame came to symbolize India's dead in its many wars for more than a hundred years, India Gate was designed by Edward Lutyens and unveiled in 1931 to primarily honor the Indian dead of the First World War alongside honoring those from battles in the Northwest frontier and during the brief Third Afghan War of 1919. The inscription on the monument shows the geographical spread of India's participation in the various theaters and campaigns of the First World War. To the dead of the Indian armies who fell and are honored in France and Flanders, Mesopotamia and Persia, East Africa, Gallipoli and elsewhere, in the Near and the Far East. The second monument is popularly known as Teen Murti after the three bronze figures that grace the roundabout in front of Teen Murti Bhavan, which was formerly called Flagstaff House and was the residence of the Commander-in-Chief of British Indian Forces. This is a memorial for troops and officers from the 15th Imperial Service Cavalry Brigade drawn from the princely states of Hyderabad, Mysore and Jodhpur who died in the First World War during battles in and around Palestine. Indian expeditionary forces, numbered from A to G, went to nearly every region where war raged. A went to France. Group B went to fight Germans in East Africa. Force C was also dispatched there. Force D was assigned the Mesopotamian campaign. Expeditionary Force E was cobbled together for service in Egypt, Palestine and Syria. Force F first defended the Suez Canal area and then scattered across various theatres. Force G fought the Gallipoli campaign in Turkey besides several other campaigns. The monuments are also a revealing reminder of how in the middle of a burgeoning national movement, India's political leaders from across the board including the Congress and the Muslim League, and even the hardliners of both Hinduism and Islam, put aside a call for self-rule to ally with Britain and its more than two dozen allies from Europe, Asia, the Americas and Africa against the Germany-led alliance of the Central Powers that included Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire ruled from Istanbul. It was seen to be for the greater good. For Indian nationalists, it was a trade-off for future political concessions. For the rulers of several princely states, self-interest might have been more personal than national, but they did make common cause against Britain's enemy alongside nationalists. For nationalist hardliners like Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Indians fighting in this global war was literally a graduation in blood, military experience that would help a free India. Every political leader of note pitched in. Annie Besant, who launched the Indian Home Rule League after Tilak's effort, also in 1916, declared, We cannot doubt that the King Emperor will, as a reward for her glorious defense of the empire, pin upon her breast the jeweled medal of self-government within the empire. Sarojini Naidu waxed eloquent about joining up for war, exhorting Indians, who are ready to die for India 
and to wipe from her brow the brand of slavery. Subramanian Bharti advocated wartime support for Britain, writing, but when trouble comes, we shall unhesitatingly stand by her and, if necessary, defend her against her enemies. Mohandas Gandhi, who in 1915 received the honor of Kaiseri Hind or Caesar of India, a medal instituted by Queen Victoria in 1900, primarily to recognize services to the empire, felt that it was more becoming and far-sighted not to press our demands while the war lasted. Indeed, even most Muslim leaders who would presumably owe allegiance to the Ottoman Empire, which controlled the Caliphate, advocated the British cause. The president of the Muslim League, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, justified the Ottoman cause for allying with Germany and yet advised Muslims of India to support the British. Whatever our grievance, whatever reforms we desire, everything must wait for a more seasonable occasion. For his part, Hyderabad's Nizam, Usman Ali Khan, provided several million rupees to underwrite cavalry regiments in France. The Begum of Bhopal, Sultan Jahan, sent Qurans for Muslim troops. Krishna Raja Wadia IV of Mysore, Madho Rao Sindhya of Gwalia, and Sayaji Rao Gaikwad III of Baroda variously provided massive funds, loans, material, and manpower. Ironically, the war's end brought the sobering realization that self-rule and Swaraj were still distant goals, and the blood of more Indians would need to flow. Returning soldiers and those of the volunteer corps also carried back stories of discrimination over wages and facilities compared to their British and white counterparts and treatment or mistreatment on the basis of caste. This contributed to fueling resentment, such as against the Rowlatt Act of early 1919, one consequence of which was a massacre in Amritsar in April 1919. There would be other protests and more deaths. Deaths would come from other small wars and the devastation of the Second World War, for which, directly as troops and as civilian collateral damage, several million Indian lives would be lost. There's an unkinder cut even to all this. Modern-day historians point to how much of the volunteer corps of the First World War, of which non-combatants made up a third of total numbers of the British Indian Army, were little more than indentured labor, coolies who died for Britain, without acknowledgement, let alone honor. In any case, the non-combatant and the civilian dead have few markers anywhere. The graves and memorial markers of the First World War's Indian soldiers lie across much of the world. At home, they are remembered and honored at India Gate and at Teen Murti. <laughs>